and discuss some issues before we go to lunch. Um, Ms. Sugiura, maybe you give the microphone to... Um, so Tallinn Silja um, has uh, experience with foreign clients, with Japanese clients already. How did you develop this at first place? Um, and what information do you have for uh, Japanese? For you mean marketing purpose? Uh, on, on the ships. Do you have something uh, on, on the signs or uh, uh, directions in Japanese already? Yes, uh, we have actually Japanese speaking attendants on board for the popular routes like Helsinki Stockholm or Helsinki Tallinn. And then also we have uh, Japanese language menus and then also uh, cruise programs and also a um, shopping guide as well. So we have a lot available in Japanese. Yes, announcement too. Yes. And how often uh, Japanese clients, clients use uh, Tallinn Celia already? Uh, I, I know this year. Well, we don't really make it public for exact numbers, but we have 10 million passengers and 5% are uh, Asian passengers. And sometimes it's like hundreds of Japanese are coming on board for Helsinki Stockholm too. But how did the start go? At, how did you plan to developing uh, this, these information and directions? What did you uh, have to think of uh, to hire these attendants and so on? Well, first of all, because Japanese people don't have really high advanced English language proficiency, so Japanese language is really important to have to um, provide as well. So you suggest that uh, if we want to attract Japanese guests to around uh, Estonia, Latvia and Finland, we have to develop, uh, to schedule planner the Japanese uh, language also. Yes, I, I really think so. And I also on board as well, but for instance, this Helsinki airport has done really good job. They have done like sign in, for instance, passport control or um, these signs is in Japanese. So it's actually saves stuff as well. So that way, yes. Okay, Tony, how easy, how easy it is to develop it uh, to Japanese? Yeah, I think it's possible to make if we have somebody who pays for it and... Yeah, the same questions. Who is yeah. responsible? Who wants to do it? Yes, it's every time that. Roger. In the Kaito project, we took responsibility and uh, working with our uh, Japanese uh, counterparts, we have a lot of publicity and marketing material and information that is now in the, the Japanese language. And what is significant is the reaction we get when Japanese people pick up the brochures, it's an interesting picture, they open it and say, oh, it's in Japanese, how wonderful. So uh, thanks to Mr. Noto and his colleagues for prov helping us to uh, provide this information and it really is quite delightful. Uh, Roger, you said that uh, there is uh uh, not any information in bus stops. So how I, we do we start from there? Uh, I think what I uh, actually said was in there are in some there are none, no information, and in rural areas it's less and less as you go beyond the main city. Um, I think it, it comes down to money, and um, it comes down to. A municipality level, uh, working with the local uh, population to raise the necessary uh, investments to improve this information and to uh, provide it so that it's understandable and an und uh, also to get an understanding that if there are going to be changes these have to be made available in a common language as well if you're in a tourism, rural tourism destination. Um, Oh, to actually take this on to another area which I'm interested in, and that is this concept of real time. Um, I've had a number of experiences where I've um, been able to pick up information about um, when to expect uh, transport. Sometimes it's, uh, it's online, the public transport is on, information is online, and then um, the t that, that time comes and passes, and what you expected hasn't happened. Um, 
one was on a, a train in Finland and I went online to see what the delayed expectation was and online it said I had already arrived and I knew I hadn't because I was some 10 kilometers outside of Helsinki. Um, in uh, the town where I live there is also information on electronic screens about when to expect the buses. But very often you, you're looking at the screen and it tells you the bus has left and it, you know it hasn't actually arrived yet. So this is not particularly on time. Question for, for Tony. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it uh, depends on the service, how you do it, because it might not be actually real-time, yeah. because it just shows the schedule in digital form, yeah. and it doesn't track where the vehicle is going or coming, but that's something that needs to be addressed. And how is that done? Uh, well, in the most easy way is to just give a mobile phone to the driver and he just uh, updates if he's late with this application. We developed one in Open Arctic Mars for testi testing uh, service and it works. I will ask uh, Roger again, uh, is it, uh, do you think, what, what, what you thought about uh, Tony's presentation, is it integratable, their system, to Estonian and Latvian uh, transport also? In a word? Yep. Yes, of course. <laughs> but how to do it? Uh, that requires, as, uh, as Tony said, and, and we've discussed earlier, it requires co commitment and collaboration between the public and the private sectors in order to make it happen. And then there needs to be um, an interest, um, there needs to be an understanding, um, particularly from the public side, um, of the needs of rural micro-businesses. Um, and I think this information is not necessarily terribly well um, distributed amongst decision makers. Um, there needs to be um, an understanding of the benefits that it would um, bring to the uh, rural economy um, to have better integration. Um, I think the projects like this and the conference like this where we're making quite clear that that uh, r rural public transport systems are, um, are not that effective in, in in getting people from an arrival point to the actual um, destination. And this, this is imp important to get through. Uh, and the impact that it has on the growth or, minim or reducing the growth of the rural economy is, is needs to be um, made clear and often to decision makers. So, Ms. Sugiura, uh, I believe that the Japanese clients in Tallinn, Celia, they are really happy. They uh, have these Japanese-speaking attendants. Do they ask uh, from them what to do further, where to go, and how to find some information? And what do the attendants tell them? Yes, exactly. That's why attendants are there for onboard. They are helping the customer. We want to treat Japanese clients really better. And then also, as a Japanese culture, the more you know, the better. So we have actually a Japanese language um, website as well. And it's what's really interesting to find out, the most popular visited page was Q&A page, because they want to know really details. So the more information is better for the Japan market. But uh, are you missing uh, of some information sites where to go, uh, the transport planner in Japanese, uh, in Estonia or Latvia? Yes, that's something we don't have it, but hopefully. <laughs> so what uh, should uh, be the next uh, steps? Uh, how to have a good uh, integrated transport planners, Roger? How to, uh, who benefits the most? The whole countries? Ho yeah, I think um, it's, uh, you one, we need to create an integrated response, which means that the industry, uh, that's the micro-businesses, need to come together with uh, transport uh, people experienced, such as Tony, in, in providing um, transport services and the uh, digitization for that. Um, people like the previous speaker from the road um, department in Latvia, and then providers such as 
um, ferry companies and, uh, and, and the bus companies, to have this broad discussion specifically about how to uh, integrate rather than to disintegrate. Um, I, I would say that a particular challenge in, in Estonia has been the uh, local government reform and the decision making delegated down to the local level for provision of services which do not go across boundaries. So this is also an issue. So the tourist industry runs right across the country. So we, we need to look into that if we're going to be able to effectively um, integrate it. But we, we can't depend only on online solutions. Is it true? Well, yeah, I mean, we, we, the online solution is purely, purely finding, providing the information about the actual services on the ground. And if, if you're connecting services left three minutes before you have arrived, then you are a bit stuck. But uh, what to do with the uh, uh, bus drivers who, who can't speak any language? Well, one hopes that they speak their own language. <laughs> yeah. um, but maybe. Um, yeah. Um, I think the big challenge is, is actually um, finding enough bus drivers that are prepared to be sympathetic to the needs of foreign visitors. Um, they maybe do speak some English, but it's difficult for them, and they are um, they have to, to run to a timetable, so they're in a hurry. They don't want to, to spend time trying to understand a foreign person's English. Um, where they don't necessarily understand English very well themselves. So there is a lot of work to be done there. And I, th I believe that um, institutions like ourselves in training and education can pr do a lot of, to offer um, specific uh, training programs to encourage them to learn the necessary words and phrases for a uh, travelling public and then to um, offer this to the public's transport companies as in-service training. This is, this is one way to do it. But I think the industry has a lot to offer as well. Um, and um, some of the feedback that we got was that it, the attitude of the, of the general public and the industry to foreign tourists is fine whether they've come frequently. But as you go further away from that, then there is less understanding of um, foreign rural tourism. Even, for example, in southwest Finland, the feedback was that there isn't a great deal of understanding. So there's a lot of work to be done in raising the profile of rural tourism and getting more people going out there, demanding service, and then maybe there will be a, a service response. Uh, Ms. Sugiura, uh, we think in Estonia that the, all the foreigners uh, who travel here are rich, re really rich, and they rent the cars and travel around like uh, kings, but, it, but it's not like this. Uh, which way uh, the Japanese tourists uh, prefer to travel around r rural areas? What's the, uh, their favorite? And you mean for the Japanese? Yeah, for the Japanese. Well, I would assume that maybe for now group uh, travel is more common because there's not so much signs available, something they can bring this um, uh, their guide together, their renting bus, but then of course if it's, um, because now in, Jap in Japanese market, this FIT market is growing, so online service and then also this sign would be really good. So am I answering questions or? It, it, if the they want to travel by car also, or by just a uh, uh, local buses also? Yeah, they I want think to bus, yes. drive a local bus also. Yeah, especially these direct consumers, I would think that they would like to try this local service. I don't think they wanted to drive a car in a foreign country in general. Because you have left uh, sided uh, uh, traffic <laughs> also. Right. This is hard for them. Yes. Is it true? Yeah. 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 Roger. Yeah, it is the case that um, they don't really want to rent a car because it is expensive. They don't necessarily have a driving license because they don't need one, uh, and in, especially if they come from the middle of a of a the mega city, and they drive on the other side of the road. So for them, it's quite wrong side. <laughs> I right come. Side. I come from Britain, so it's the correct side. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, questions from the audience. 
Um, I have a question for Tallink. Um, have you also thought about arranging trips for your groups? Because you are pampering Japanese students there. They are safe there? And Tallink as a corporation probably has an interest not to send them away from their premises, but rather to keep them attached. So how do you see, or if there has been a maybe talks about how to integrate Tallink into also rural areas? Well, of course, like we always cooperate with like um, these partners. Uh, with visit Estonia, visit Latvia, visit Finland. So like this is really good for us as well because we are in the end connecting these four countries on the Baltic Sea. So like if there is this like idea from, for instance, visit Estonia, visit Latvia, that would be really great for both of us to promote more why Japanese people want to come. Yeah, Thank and you. Then also, sorry. Yeah. And then when we go to workshop, we are usually together with Finnair or visit Finland or visit Estonia. So we promote together why you wanted to come to Baltic countries as well. So we should uh, contact Tallink to, uh, to interact. There are other, uh, other ways in which at the local level um, mo mobility for um, foreign uh, visitors can be enhanced. Uh, Tourist information offices, for example, um, have um, provided localized um, maps or information about which bus to get onto and which, which stop to ask the driver to tell you to get off in order to go to see monuments or special sites. And indeed, in Latvia, um, they've gone to the extent of purchasing uh, bicycles um, for, of different sizes for family groups, uh, particularly for Japanese so that they can then cycle and they've offered them cycling track information where it's safe to cycle off the main roads so it is gradually being recognized that this um, is a service which is sellable or is is required or is needed and i also tony said that the, it's uh, embeddable for the tourism uh, uh, company sites also if you if we integrate this uh, to estonia or latvia for example tourism company can put uh, this to their own web page is it true yeah it's true but it doesn't have your services currently it has only finnish services so you have to kind of do your own or at, at your mobility services to this one. Okay, but it's a future thing. Yes. If somebody's responsible. I, I, think, I think what's also needed is uh, we need to encourage the transport providers to uh, opt in to these services, even in uh, where it's been well practiced and, and, and run for quite some some years. In Finland, there are some companies that don't want to join because they see themselves as being drowned by the other services and they will lose their identity. So it's not possible to buy through tickets um, with them or for them that they haven't wished to join these private sector um, run services. Yeah, that's true, but um, now the EU legislation is forcing them to open their APIs so that you can uh, buy their tickets from other services also and that's very good thing. I think uh, here we have like ideal uh, team together like uh, uh, developer, scientists and the big companies uh, back there so we have, uh, we have to have something in the future if you work together. You'll be the publicist. Yeah, of course, of course. <laughs> but do, you, do we have some more questions? Or we give the round of applause to the speakers? No? Okay, let's give it hap hands up for uh, Roger Evans, Tony Lusica and uh, Miss Misa Sugiura. Thank you.